Welcome everyone. Um, happy to have Lech Muzinski from Oregon State University here um, give us his perspective on the mass timber supply chain. And also he has a very international perspective from the EU, the US and globally. So looking forward to his presentation. I think we're all set with the screen share. Thank you, Lech, please take it away. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a great event, and uh, I've listened to listened to to most of the talks ahead of me, and uh, all exciting. Um, I hope I can match the the level of of uh, um, set up by the predecessor. So, this is about about the supply chain, uh, chaining the the industry, right? So, uh, let me start with who we are. Um, what I'm going to present to you is a labor of, of a large team, not only the co-authors or copy eyes on the uh, grants that we receive to get this, this uh, work done, but also a number of uh, graduate and undergraduate students who just helped us uh, along the way. And outside of this uh, regular funding providers, uh, funding agency uh, in, in the US, we've also used uh, kindness or funding or other ways of support from from the Linus University uh, Estonian um, uh, entity whose name I'm forgetting right now SEC and so on. Now what we do uh, with this funding is uh, surveying the global CLT industry not focusing exclusively in North America but looking beyond this uh, the continent and actually to the places where it started and outside because we believe that what happens around the globe with the industry that is so new and so diverse is a great laboratory that uh, let us know what can happen and have a little insight in the in the future um, one of the bottom lines of what we know about the global industry is that, that this is a very new phenomenon. It's not, uh, it is very unlike any uh, forest products or even engineered, smart engineered forest products that you may have seen uh, before. The industry now, and uh, as I would like to refer to CLT, not as much as a product, as but as technology, it integrates elements of mass timber design, manufacturing technologies, and construction, the, the stress here is on integrating, right? And it is not follow the typical commodity oriented um, forest products industry models. The question of commoditization or commodity of this uh, product or technology is popping up uh, very often in many talks. And I would like to, to address it a little bit um, as we go in here. So, uh, commodity, right? This is the dictionary uh, definition of a commodity. It has many fun, funny uh, um, references in here. But the, the first thing that we see in here is like this is a good or service whose uh, white availability and while a white availability already cancels out, right? The, the commodity nature of, of silt right now typically leads to smaller profit margins. I don't think this is true for this industry and diminishes the importance of the uh, factor as brand name or uh, price and again i don't think this is this is quite true for this industry and that i don't think it's going to be true anytime soon and one that is subject of ready exchange or exploitation within market i don't see that way actually I like this uh, statement from a friend of mine from OSU who said that uh, we've been boxed for quite a long time in this dichotomy that you either produced specialty products in uh, small scale and small quantities or you went like uh, you, you would go with commodity products on large scale but uh, with very much limited uh, diversity of, of options and in, within this product and now Something has changed in the uh, last decades, I would say, and not necessarily within the, the uh, forest product industry outside, but it's dripping into um, forest product industry. And this is the uh, digital design and fabrication platforms uh, that substantially expand the range of manufacturing options. And you can actually start thinking, actually we are living through this, right? Um, like mass uh, customization of products, 
producing things in large quantities with great flexibility. So that much for for starters. So with with chains, right? I'm not a economist by training. I, I um, don't know much about markets. I had to educate myself about chains, and I know as much that some chains are designed in a way that uh, help to propel you move forward, and others are well, just the other kind, right? That uh, rather slow you down. Uh, to make sure, I did my homework on on supply versus and and. Uh, supply versus supply chain. I already see a problem here. This was supposed to be value chain uh, versus value chain, right? But um, it speaks on both sides, whether you, you look at, at one or the other, to the responsiveness of a industry or a company to the, the client and to opportunities uh, to, to gain an edge of uh, competitive edge. I will not make much distinction between these two in my talk, right? I'm not properly qualified to do that. So let us take a look at the typical commodity um, supply chain within forest products. It goes like in linear fashion, essentially, right? From forest through primary processing, transportation. And actually, if you are the log or if you are the lumber manufacturer, it may stop in here. Well, the industrial hardware would be still part of your uh, of your supply chain, but then this is just what you do, and and it disappears from a threshold. If you are doing uh, engineered with products, right panels, this includes uh, the manufacturing adhesives, right? But th that's essentially the entire supply chain that you need to uh, consider, and then you put your stuff on the market and it just magically disappears. And you don't need to worry where it goes, whether to construction, uh, to um, in this case for, for plywood, for farming, or to Home Depot, right? Where individuals just pick up uh, piece by piece and they decide on their own what to do with them. Now, things are very different if you scale up to a panel that may be, um, of considerable uh, sizes, right? 13 feet across, 65 foot uh, long. That may be about 500 cubic foot, right? For metrics uh, of you will be like 14 cubic meters of uh, wood material in there. They may uh, weigh in uh, north of, of uh, five tons. And it, intrinsic value would be like about 12,000 a piece. Um, I mean, the this sheer scale of this, right, changes a lot in, in the equation. Can you just send it to a construction site and let people just, you know, uh, custom fabricate house at the, at the site? I don't think so. I mean, it's a panel, right? Panel is a panel is a panel. But when you, when you think of what has been um, available on the market so far, these were light panels that a single person could just carry around and you could do the fabrication on the site, right? This was the, where the flexibility and where the beauty, and until now, I'm still in love with light frame construction, right? Where the beauty is, you are essentially fabricating a house on the site from uh, commodity materials with great flexibility. You can decide in the last moment to cut a window here and door here, move something, right? Change it does not cost much. Now, the the product, I mean, building would be just one of the potential applications for this kind of panels, and this is equally true for uh, stock glue lamb or or other type of panels, right? Or beams um, of of different kinds, studs, uh, eye joists, right? These are all very smart products to be sure, right? But uh, they are kind of commodity. You can, you can send them and adapt uh, them on the site, fabricate. The manufacturer does not need to worry how you get from here, from the production to construction, right? The customization may go as far as what kind of preservative treatment or surface finish you use uh, in order to make it uh, work one way or the other. But then again, these monsters, right? Uh, can you treat them the same way? Can you can you really fabricate, custom fabricate uh, these cut openings, right? And uh, 
uh, do all other cut them to size on the side the way you you do uh, with with plywood panels and the the answer is well no and the temptation is to say well but the, there is precedence right there is the model you have uh, the custom glue lamp that you the large large beams large elements that you send to uh, the the construction site prefabricated right they would require that the architects know something about the uh, nature of wood right that the engineers uh, of just specify how exactly the beam should look like before they go to, go to uh, custom fabrication and they are being sent to the construction site you have the special day beams are coming beams are coming right you construct them but then everything else is pretty linear and um, the the uh, the rest of the construction goes you know the the regular way and this is because Poston beams is a very old concept. So everybody is familiar with this concept. You cannot become an engineer or become an architect unless you know how to work with uh, beams and posts, right? Uh, and even non-engineers uh, know, know a lot about it. Uh, even curved beams, right, that uh, make so much uh, hype. If you think about it, I mean, uh, let me play with this a little bit. I turned this picture, right? This is an old concept as well. Right, we have this in our our bloodstream. This this is not new. Uh, sophisticated uh, timber framing that's been around for for quite a time. So there is nothing essentially new to be explained to anybody in the supply chain. Right, the the lumber manufacturers know what you expect. The architects know how how to deal with this, and the the engineer knows how to specify. It. It's it's pretty linear. But then again, how do you deal with this? And the primary thing would be the, the, the first thing that, that comes to mind. It's not that the um, large panel enabled prefabrication. Actually, it's like the, the other way around. The large panel prohibits the, the custom fabrication on the site. So including the prefab in this, is a necessity, not a not a option that we capture in order to become a 4.0 industry, right? So this is the first thing. Now you cannot also rely on on the architect being uh, immediately out of the school, you know, uh, familiar with this stuff. There is some education that needs to go, right? Uh, the architect needs to be a, intimately familiar with um, the concept of panelized uh, structure and with dealing with these heavy structures. Yes, the prefab concrete panels uh, have been a predecessor, but then they're like seven times heavier, right? And they are being made on site quite often. And the, the, the level of prefabrication is different and connectors, now you, you need to think very differently about it. Same with the, the engineer, right? So they become a members of your supply chain in a very different way than before. And it, there is a new level of coordination that is required in order to make this happen. So you would like as, as a manufacturer, right? If you want your project to, to be shining and do not, not to get a black eye, you would like the architect to be familiar with your manufacturing process and with the limitations. And I would encourage all aspiring architects who would like to start designing with this to go to your next uh, closest manufacturer of CLT, go through the, through the line. Now, the thing is not only to learn about the limitations, right, but there are new horizons. Actually, this liberating process, you will find out things that are possible that uh, Nobody has ever tried yet, but they are already possible in the in the manufacturing line due, due to the um, uh, digitized fabrication, right? So this is the liberating thing. Um, you're familiar with this this um, Seville parasol, one of the largest uh, timber structure, not a building, right, but a structure. So this is the thing. Now, as you do this, the connections become uh, part of your supply chain in very different way again. Um, 
at, at first the industry went on with the, the fittings and connectors uh, designed for a glue land for massive, uh, massive timber of uh, noodle shape, right? But then not all of them uh, have proved to be equally efficient and uh, arguably right now the, the connectors is the most fertile ground for innovation in mass timber industry, particularly for panelized, uh, panelized uh, structures. This is where, where money is to be, great money is to be, to be made. Now, the, the coordination of the project, because now you are sending this, you would also like your uh, construction crew to know how to deal with this material. You cannot just dump this stuff, you know, uh, under the weather or in, in a puddle and so, so that it's just waiting on the construction site for its, its uh, turn. This has to be coordinated. And now the, this coordination becomes so complex that the essential part of this becomes the IT, the, uh, the modeling, the project integration software and platforms, the BIM uh, that, that uh, supports the coordination of projects. So you see, gradually we become, uh, we, we start understanding the, the final product of this entire thing, right? You may be a CLT manufacturer, but you don't sell CLT. What you sell is projects, is buildings, structures, right? Be that a house or the, the Sevilla parasol, this is what you are selling, right? And for this, the architect becomes your necessary acquisition, um, project acquisition uh, partner, so to speak, right? You cannot start unless somebody dreams a structure for which specifically you will make your, your panels, right? So this, this is becoming more and more integrated. Now, uh, once, once we see the difficulties and prohibitions with the customization and uh, fabrication of the uh, panels on the side, you out of sudden are in the business of thinking in a very new way about the, the mechanicals of the building, right? So this is again where the beam platform helps, but the, the mechanicals become part of your supply chain because you need to know ahead of time where they are going to come in order to be able to uh, fabricate the or finish the, the panels. It's like funny thoughts that uh, most of the manufacturers, even of this uh, large, very smart uh, glue lamp beams, right, specialty glue lamp beams, have never, uh, do, 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 don't need to worry much about, right? Now, another, another important part becomes the smart delivery. I mean, it's not like the here's the glue lamp day, right? The big beam is coming to, to the construction site. No, you are actually in the charge of sending the, the panels that are each meant for a specific, very specific place in the building, uh, one by one, or actually it's more, much more um, appropriate in kind of like IKEA package, where you open the package and you unload it in a specific sequence to uh, for that supports the, the speedy construction. Now for this, again, the manufacturer needs to know uh, what is going to be the sequence and pack them on the on the track that way. Okay, so this is where the efficiency comes. And I stole this uh, this graph from a uh, publication of uh, Paul Kramer and and uh, his partner. And this is where the greatest savings in the CLT or the mass timber construction comes, not in the foot square foot by square foot uh, cost of the of the material. Although we, the industry is getting there, right? But the great savings are in the speed and efficiency of the construction. Instead of, of constructing within months, you can construct within weeks. I mean, the large buildings, the the icons, uh, the early icons of tall wood buildings, the um, Murray Grow uh, building in in uh, London. This was like one week per story. Crazy, right? Uh, the building in Forte building in uh, Melbourne. It was like four days a story, and ten stories that way. This is where the savings come, but. 
this means that it's for the CLT manufacturer, right? The, the transportation and the sequencing and cons construction becomes part of the, of the business, part of the concern. And then why should you stop at the shell? Typically, the, the, uh, or in, in many cases, the final product, I, I lied to you that this is a building. It's a shell of a building, right? There is a lot that needs to go into the building before it becomes like functional item or inhabitable, inhabitable or, or a, a place where you can do your business. You actually need to, do, uh, to add doors, windows, uh, insulation, uh, think of building maintenance, right? So some of them may just, you know, up, be applied to the building no matter how it is being built, but certain types may require certain customization or uh, fittings or, or adaptations in order to be installed properly. Again, it becomes the business of CLT manufacturer, right? Uh, if there are some special um, you know, special requirements for this. And again, because the industry is new and there is still a sense that a single, um, let's say, disaster, right? Uh, leakage, uh, single uh, the fire, this a little small scale distraction may, may give a black eye to the entire industry, right? You may be interested also in how this building is going to be maintained through the, its its lifetime or service uh, uh, service life. So this becomes uh, again within the scope of concern for the CLT manufacturer for the CLT industry and becomes part of its supply chain. Now, one thing that should be uh, said and, and stressed. Another integral part is education and training. I mean, it's not only the training of the architect and your engineer and the um, project managers and your construction crews and the transport. All of this is true, right? But this is um, also educating potential clients, communities, uh, everyone essentially along the supply chain. Anecdotally, and this comes from Paul Kremer when I visited with him in 2018, he told me he spends like 50% of his valued uh, management uh, level paid uh, time educating, educating everyone. I mean, his own coworkers, uh, his crews at the, at the, um, uh, at the factory and everyone along the supply chain, 50% of time of uh, go going into education. So this is where entities like Woodworks and Woodworks is just what we know in here. Uh, all markets, virtually all markets uh, outside of, of uh, North America has something like this, a, a entity devoted to education of uh, everyone along the supply chain about what this, this industry is in order to, to smooth this thing out. And finally, research. Normally in forest products, uh, research just happens, you know, innovation happens uh, once uh, uh, on, on the blue, blue moon. That, I mean, research happens all the time, right? I'm academic. Uh, this is what I do for, for a living. But then something that changes, really changes uh, the, the way industry moves, happens once under, under Blue Moon. Now, not so with, with the mass timber uh, industry. This is something that is like necessary for all these uh, projects that uh, push the envelope. And there are actually many projects that push the envelope because the industry is so new. I mean, there are types of structures that nobody has tried before to execute in the, the mass timber. So research becomes part, integral part of the supply chain in here. And I think I've managed so far to tell you that by, um, or convince you that uh, all of this, all of these elements of the supply chain have not been selected by choice. It's like all of them are there by necessity. 
and the novelty and competitive advantage of, of this industry seems to lie in a very unique combination of the value and supply chains that form like this uh, chain of mail, right, or mail chain, um, rather than a linear supply or, or value chain. And something that is also that I've heard for the first time from Paul Kramer, but then um, interviewing people in the industry for, for years after, I kept asking the same questions about education and also the, the relation to the supply chain. Everybody stresses that there are multiple, multiple benefits from all parties around, along the supply chain to be involved in a project or in the, the process from very beginning and to stay on, to stay true. This may be less true for harvesting and primary processing, although I have some ideas and some thoughts uh, about it as well. But about the rest of them, I mean, it would be like nice to have them in the King Arthur style, uh, the round table from the very beginning where the conversation may uh, start with uh, what's in your mind, architect, right? And what is possible manufacturer how can we specify the engineer, right? And how can we manage this to the construction side? So uh, getting feedback from the, uh, from the contractor on what is feasible and what would make things easier for them. All of this is very much possible in this, in this model. Now, this entire situation, this air of indispensable, uh, indispensable uh, early dialogue of the of the parties involved in this entire process of manufacturing houses and, and structures, right, rather than than panels, creates an incentive for vertical integration. And now, I don't have any hard data on this, but you can imagine, and I can take you on a, like imaginary. A tour back in time where the first CLT panels have been like conceived as an idea of scaling up uh, anecdotally we know from from Switzerland scaling up like the box beam right uh, with the veneer surfaces and the uh, stick core used primarily in furniture right and this uh, industry suffering losses to MDF and people trying to reinvent themselves scaling up this to structural panel uh, large scale now again where do you where do you sell it where is the the warehouse what is the where is the home depot that can that can carry them there is none right where is the architect that knows how to use the panels of these types well you need to actually talk to somebody i don't know brother-in-law who has a degree in architecture and just get them uh, on the on the uh, to the table and say, could you could you just design something for me so that we can do like the, you know demonstration project, and then you reach to your uncle engineer right and and uh, get them uh, to the table, and then you uh, somehow join forces, coordinate the project right, you, you find out a friend contractor. Uh, try to find someone who would buy a, or risk buying this kind of project, right? And you make the, the demonstration project. Once you do it, I mean, okay, now you have like first clients. We would also like to have a house like this. This is like fantastic, right? Do you go and educate another uh, set of, of people along there? Um, wouldn't it be nice to have a engineer and the uh, product uh, or the project management uh, person on the payroll on the permanent basis within your within your uh, company of course it would be nice right occasionally it would be nice to have a architect if you if they would agree to to stay with you rather than doing the the freelancing or do all kind of other projects right but it's like uh, and companies do it i mean the this kind of uh, supply chain that you see in here this kind of model of integration is quite common in clt industry does everybody do it no not everybody but many people do and the same once you once you have this nice prefabricated panels why would you just uh, give somebody else who does not know this material and may mistreat it right to transport it to the construction site and actually you would like to have your own construction site to take care of this uh, beautiful panels and the and the construction because again when you are the first one to offer this 
there may be no no other person to or no other company that knows how to how to put this thing together now once you have put together this the supply chain right um it may actually be quite profitable to have a control uh, over this thing and just own this part uh, certain parts of the supply chain quite often you see vertical integration, including this part, but this is less of a choice. This is probably uh, by companies who inherit this from their previous lives. They have been in the forest product business, uh, glue lamps, right? Or uh, they may have been lumber manufacturers, right? Like many of the, the current uh, mass timber panel companies have been in their previous lives. So they just inherit this part within the supply chain. It's part of the company. Uh, education uh, does not need uh, any further comment because this again in this business education is going to be part of your activity you want it or or you don't right if you if you neglect it it's at your own peril now the combinations are endless right anecdotally uh, particularly the first uh, early adopters they were heavily involved in designing and many and some of them even in production of their own um, industrial hardware, this large area presses, right? Um, then uh, uh, conceiving the, the CNC uh, finishing centers, right? Um, they, they, they were heavily involved in this and in designing and constructing their own fittings, right? And again, anecdotally, I know at least of one of, of manufacturers that creates manufacturers, not just integrates, but manufacturers uh, their own doors and windows uh, for the construction that are being pre-installed in the, in the panels. There are much many, uh, there are much more, uh, sorry, there's greater number of, of companies that do pre-install windows and doors uh, fabricated some, somewhere else. And again, I know at least of one company that does uh, their own insulation and, and siding all integrated within the company. So none of the companies has it all, right? But it's just, uh, I, I was trying to delineate a space of possibilities. And sure enough, when we interviewed uh, companies back into uh, 2016, uh, many of them, right? This is like a, a set of 18, so you can see the proportion, right? In first is just by the number of companies integrating certain parts of the supply chain um within the company just owning this part as they own right and here is like reflected by their output so the the size of the bar would be combined output of companies that integrate this part of of um, supply chain now below the radar are companies that uh, formally do not own these parts of the uh, supply chain, but they are being owned by international concerns that do have a good control over all of these remaining parts, right? As part of the regular business. And on top of it, they just uh, own the CLT manufacturing. So the manufacturer may not feel like having control over this entire process the way they uh, they they showed right but this is how, how uh, things actually are it still does not make them commodity manufacturers now the question is can one drop the manufacturing and be vertically integrated uh, company with many of these functions uh, and and elements of the supply chain integrated right but not manufacturing CLT? And the answer is yes. The One of the, the largest, most successful is eUrban. We've just heard uh, a couple of days ago from Swinerton and our sweet host uh, on this series is Cut My Timber, right? All of these companies at some level and at some scale exercise exactly this. They own these parts of the supply chain, right? And they just order the panels from a manufacturer. Does this make a CLT manufacturing, that does this movement, right? Um, although it has to be said, it is not a very common, uh, not very common constellation. Does this movement uh, move or, or turn gradually CLT into commodity? No, 
because still the manufacturer is going to make a very special product, a set of panels, right? For the IKEA box that is going to go to the very specific construction site in very special sequence. And every each and every panel is going to put there in, in their own specific way, right? So it does not make it com uh, commodity, right? Even if this kind of model becomes commonplace. So where does the industry go from here? I should say, I wish I knew, right? Uh, give me a crystal ball and uh, and we'll talk then. But I think uh, the the flexibility that has been created within this industry by necessities, as I said, right? By the sheer size of the panel that just uh, precludes customization or or custom fabrication on the construction site, right? So this flexibility that happened, right? The, the arrival point uh, with the de facto industry 4.0, even though nobody was aiming at this, right? Creates a new quality. And I wonder if it would make even sense to step back and try to commoditize this, uh, this industry. I mean, I think it would be quite hard to convince uh, manufacturers to shed some of this of these functions, those particularly who are vertically integrated and are already very much like Nordic, who spoke. Um, uh, we, we've heard um, a talk earlier uh, today, right? Like Nordic and other companies who provide the the entire surface uh, from certain elements of architectural design. If not the architectural design, at least they have architect on payroll to to speak architect with the architect that is the author of the of the design, right? Uh, to the the construction site and at times to to siding. How how would you convince them to just uh, relinquish this and just go and shrink back to just manufacture of of panels and waiting for the projects to to come outside? Once you learn that once you are in there, right? Why would you do that? So again, as far as the, as the, this is my, my gut feeling, right? But, but as far as the industry, industry goes uh, in, in the future, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, this is a good starting point for, for conversation on the future of the industry and its current state of the art and how, how this knowledge, how this understanding of this complex um, supply or value chain, if you will, shapes the industry and how it propels it forward is definitely not the hindering um, ball and chain, right, that uh, uh, we've, we've contemplated at the, at the beginning. I see it as a value, uh, even if, if the sentiment is still quite palpable when you, when you interview manufacturers, they kind of, they grew up in a commodity type uh, of industry. And some of them, they still feel uneasy with the um, custom uh, type of manufacturing that they are involved in. Um, they would be most happy if they could just produce a large number of uh, uniform pounds in standard sizes, right? And the, the pounds just disappear from the, tr from the threshold. But there are some intrinsic barriers to be overcome before this, this happens. And even the emergence of the companies that take care of everything else outside of this does not relieve them from this position. Now that end at this point and open for, for questions, I'll try to respond the best I can. You're familiar with this image? You know who this person is? This person, actually. The Pythia in Delphi, predicting future in an enigmatic way. I can do it for you. I can, I can predict future in a way that will be like uh, have as many options and, and meanings as, as you wish. Thanks so much for a great presentation. It's, uh, you know, you sure traveled around and seen a lot in, in the industry. So that, that's great. 
Um, you know, I guess we have some time now for, for questions. Uh, unfortunately, Greg is uh, he's only passive, he's in a suede an airport, so I'll, I'll read the questions. And, uh, you know, to the audience, if, if you have more questions for Lech right now would be the time. So uh, please uh, use the, the chat function or the question and answer function, and I will read the questions and then uh, hopefully Lech can answer those for us. So I have the first question or the only question so far from uh, Nitin Lear. Um, it's written, between the different parties involved in the supply chain, which groups are better today at communicating and where is there a need for more communication and collaboration? So uh, I certainly have an opinion about that too, doing what I do, but I, I'll let uh, Lech answer that, that question. Uh, go ahead. This is an excellent question. And then again, it comes from, um, my, my knowledge of the, of the industry it comes from interviewing people, uh, visiting the uh, CLT manufacturing companies but not functionally working within the industry, right? So actually in this case, Stefan's uh, response would be more valuable, but from this superficial observation, I would say that the engineers, uh, particularly those that, that are incorporated in, uh, in the, the um, vertical integration, uh, scheme of, of the industry are already integrated in the in the company. These are people who are very well versed in the conversation with the architects up the stream, with the uh, with the uh, fiber uh, suppliers up the stream, and with the construction uh, crews uh, down the stream. They <clears throat> then quite often companies have. Um, a separate unit for project coordinations, then the, the eloquence uh, is migrating towards, uh, towards this unit. But um, I think more and more architects understand the potential and the peculiarity of this industry better and are getting better in uh, respecting its limitations, but also are getting better in uh, harnessing all of this new possibilities that exist in there. I mean, there is fine balance between daring and hub, hub risk, right? But, uh, but I think most of the architects strike the balance quite well. And uh, this is where the, where the highlights of the communications uh, happen. How do you see it, Stefan? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's definitely you know, I always, I mean, we're very cat driven. Everything, our project management is basically evolving around a 3D model of some sort. And that's a, a really good common language. And in the past, I, I saw a lot of those issues like um, technical is like, oh, we could just import those files and stuff. And now we, we have that sort of resolved. I mean, it's still an issue, but it, it's sort of resolved. And um, I see more and more now we have lawyer issues you know it's like well I, I don't really want to share that with you because that's our IP or or that's uh, well mm -hmm. if I give you that and then something goes wrong then we're on the hook I, I think the industry needs to sort of figure out you know let's work together and and um, you know the, the whole thing more as a, as a team approach and, and not just as a single company and then the finger pointing and and that's i know that's easy to say but that's that that's a, a big issue so, so immediately envision adding here lawyers right <laughs> yeah and i i really <laughs> wish we would need that chain. because uh, no lawyer will build your building, you know, and also uh, it's not going to make it any cheaper, but that, that that's a big, and, and I think maybe we should have some standards and, um, you know, we're, we're always very open. We, we, we're happy to share data and I think people need to, you know, as they go kind of, you know, also double check data kind of like not just blindly take stuff or go from there but that, that's a very big conversation and I, I think this is sort of hindering uh, you know sort of a vertical integration of multiple companies and so there's that and then there's all the you know like conflict of interest and all those issues but I think they're, they're a little less 
Um, so what, what worked well for us and, and uh, is, is really just kind of have repeat partners because a, a big portion of it is, is education both ways. We need to understand how a design team thinks, what, what their intent is. And, and you know, after the second project, that's usually a lot easier to kind of figure out what they want. And then we can tailor technical solutions to that. Um, but yeah, I certainly I don't have to, <laughs> to answer there, but I, I see that more and more of a technical or of a, uh, an issue with just like who is in charge of what and, 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 and then, you know, like also on the hook for what, and it's not so much of a technical issue anymore. Um, I have some, volume yeah. To the, to the virtues of the early involvement of all parties. Uh, and this, is equally true for, for the manufacturer who would like to get everybody on, on board as early as possible. But again, if you're an architect, right, and you're dreaming a fabulous uh, mass timber uh, white unicorn, get talk to the target um, CLT manufacturer or mass timber panel manufacturer of your choice early. Understand what they do and how. Talk to the engineers they have on the board, right? Uh, you will be liberated. You're, you're not going to be limited by, by this involvement. You will feel liberated for how much is possible. Yeah. And you're, you're ending up with a better product at, at a lower cost. I mean, I always say it's like the costs of a, a, an engineer, just their fees, that's, that's the smaller portion. But then what, you know, his work could really affect your, your building cost. And, and so that's sometimes I, I see that. I think that's true for all parties on, on your craft, it, it's people tend to just look at the cost of each individual line item or, or product or service, but then, you know, like it's maybe, you know, saves money for the, on the panels, but then it adds more cost on the hardware and, and things like that. So it really needs to be looked and worked on as, as a whole, as a whole system. Mm -hmm. So I have a few other questions that came in, uh, maybe less. So uh, Jan Padilla says, as we can't predict what Sure. What did you see in past projects, past years that changed dramatically nowadays? What current jobs in the industry may be totally absolute in the future? And what kind of education or skills need to be integrated or taught to keep? Sorry, your, your audio is uh, chopping. I, I did not hear the entire question. Okay, I, I apologize. I, I'll reread it. So the question is, as we can't predict what is going to happen in the future, what did you see in the past, in past projects, past years that changed dramatically nowadays? And then also what current jobs in the industry may be totally absolute in the future and what kind of education or skills need to be integrated or taught to keep jobs afloat? So let me uh, respond to this in, in two, um, uh, on two levels. Like the, the greatest revolution that is going right now, I mean, the, the industry is revolution on its own, right? But the greatest revolution within this revolution right now is the emergence of the, uh, not one, but at least three major uh, hardware, industrial hardware manufacturers that um, increasingly offer ter turnkey, uh, highly automated lines, uh, which makes, and high capacity lines, which makes the, the high capacity, new high capacity lines more alike and they're, they're potential, their um, capacity, not in, in, in the sense of the volume, but in sense of what they can do with this material, uh, also similar. Uh, again, it's not a sign of commodity, right? But it will make it easier for all other parties to understand what is possible. And it will make it easier for large projects to be turned around quickly Right, rather than building up uh, the, the elements uh, slowly on, on a less efficient line. So this is one so, thing that they see yeah. in the future. I'm sorry, real quick, like, so, so, so we, to be precise, if you talk about hardware lines, we're, we're talking about CLT 
manufacturing and fabrication, right? So, yes. so uh, presses, CNC exactly. cutting lines, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to, you know, hardware is always that's a big word too. So, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Yeah, and then the second part of what current jobs in the industry may be totally absolute in the future, and what kind of education or skills needed to be integrated. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what what kind of uh, we, which part of this can become obsolete. Um, uh, I think the industry will need the education for a long time into the future. I mean, with all this hype, right? I uh, in other presentations I show a, a slide where I compare a visually like the two millions of cubic meters annually produced by uh, the CLT industry with 180 million cubic meters of just plywood of other, other engineer, uh, engineered wood products, right? Globally. I mean, this is a boutique size, small scale industry in uh, its infancy, right? It's not a baby, not a toddler any longer, but it's still an infant, right? And it looks like many things are still possible. This is what makes it so hard to predict uh, where the industry is, is going. Um, it is easier to predict on the horizon of the next two, three, five years. But what, what, is, what is this going to look like in 10 years? It's anybody's guess, right? Um, so now I, I don't see of these elements of the of the supply chain that I incorporated in in my graphs. I don't see any becoming uh, obsolete anytime maybe, soon. Maybe what I see a trend, and I, I may be wrong too, but I mean it seems the trend clearly points to more more offsite. I mean, labor is going up, the, the, the safety requirements are getting harder, and, and that kind of leads to essentially, you know, being expensive to do stuff out in the rain on site. So I, I could see that, you know, like, we're, we're, you know, there's big jobs right now where they have a framing crew of 50 or 100 framers that basically figure out the building as they go and, mm -hmm. and frame it there. I, I could see, and I, I've already seen that uh, back home in, in Europe, that we, we don't have that. It's just in Switzerland, it's way too expensive to have that many people on the job site um, mm -hmm. trying to figure this out. So I, I would say, if, 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 if I would have to ask her the question, what, what's going to be absolute? I think having people figuring out building as they go. It's just that the whole requirement for acoustic building, building science in general, you know, thermal performance, uh, structural performance. I think that, that those, those criteria has become more and more important and it's, it's hard to kind of figure that out on, on site. So I, I would say that that's my guess that that may be absolute or, or greatly reduced, I think. Uh, and we see that already with, with mass timber buildings, you know, there's small crews and, and those chops move much faster because it's, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot quicker. Oh, so I understood this question as applying to the, the mass timber panel industry alone. So uh, if you look at the timber construction in general, yeah, you're abso absolutely right. Um, what I see as a, as, a, as a future is there's a lots of talk about this volumetric uh, elements, right? And mm -hmm. there, there is a beauty of it uh, being, you know, installed as ready unit in larger uh, buildings. Uh, but then there are also headache in transportation. You are transporting a lot of, a lot of air. So what I've seen as conceptualized, although I have not seen it uh, being done, is uh, two-step prefabrication. The IKEA assets uh, getting to the construction site where you have like a temporary hood, and this can be, you know, your uh, CLT little a temporary building, right? Where you do just the assembly of those before they just go on the on the structure, right? And all of this being uh, performed on time, on the ground. Uh, yeah. So this is something that sounds to me interesting. Uh, whether the, the future is going to go that way, I'm not sure. <laughs>
but I see a problem with transporting uh, a train of, of empty boxes, right, to the construction site uh, as much as, as they can be fe- furnished inside, right? And, uh, but I see the value of the, in the particularly in the speed of, of installation when, when you put and pile up these boxes on the construction site. So it's something to be to be watched. Yeah. So one more question, and then we're almost coming to the end. So uh, Frank Weeks wants to know: Are other builders besides Swinerton making moves to raise the profile of mass timber building in North America? And he says it's nice to see leadership. Um, what's your take there with uh, large builders in North America? Well, I must say that I don't have much insight in in this part. My my interest is um, is uh, mainly in manufacturing, right? And what happens? What is clustered around the around the manufacturing? So I observe emergence of these uh, companies that just do all of this except of manufacturing alone, right? Like Swinertons, uh, E-Urbans, or Cut My Timbers. And I think there is a bright future in front of them, but I, I'm not tracking this uh, part of industry uh, with the same level of, of uh, attention as I do uh, for the manufacturers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know that for sure too. I guess that's maybe somebody from Swinerton could answer that better than we can, um, you know, about the competition, but... Um, what I see is, in, in general, you know, the mass timber projects we're doing now, those are mostly commercial, fairly large structures. And um, so often there is a, a commercial general contractor involved, like, like large companies. That's just kind of the nature of the, of the beast. Those projects are so big and costly that that takes a big builder. And then they would sort of work with a specialty contractor or subcontractor to do to do the mass timber portion of it, and that can range from just being a mass timber installer all the way to basically a mass timber one-stop shop supplier. In, in terms where, where that company then sources mm-hmm. um, sources that 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 product uh, is involved with design engineering, value engineering, etc., and, and also performs the install. So I think there is there is more more, and and you know some people like a you know, they used to be log home builders, uh, big timber framers. So that's, I think they're very well suited for, for those mass timber installs because they, they know wood as a product and how to handle big components. And they're used to be careful with stuff and, and whatnot. Um, and but that's just, more on the install side, right? And I just see that in the future, the, the general trend of the manufacturers integrating these functions and offering the the full service uh, from um, even from the, the architectural design, but uh, let's put it that way, taking the act- architectural uh, design in as on the input, right? And then providing uh, either a shell of the building or the finished building and on the other end, this is going to, to continue. If you observe all the large uh, scale manufacturers, they all go this, this way. And then there is also something to be said, the white unicorns that uh, hit the um, headlines uh, that you hear about, these large uh, buildings pushing the envelope, they are not the bread and butter of the, of the industry. You can still you know, put all of these projects on one page and how good do they do in terms of the industry that has about 100 uh, manufacturers already globally? most of the projects fly under the radar, uh, like more mundane. And this is, this is where the, the volume, where the profit uh, is. Yeah. Lisa just had a good point. Uh, I forgot that. Yeah, she says, um, Lend Lease would be a good example of a large contractor leading the advancements of mass timber in the US. And uh, they're certainly very international. Um, uh, but yeah, they uh, they're making a big push, and I think they have a, a bunch of really big projects going. So that that's true. That that would be a good a good example. I don't know how much of of the fabrication and manufacturing they would do, but they're, they're certainly a sort of a self performing 
uh, builder where they're, you know, where they're also installing and, and whatnot. So there is, again, there's the install part and then there's the manufacturing part and, and then there's just that general contracting managing part, so. But in, in all, of the, all of this, again, Mass Timber would enforce even on this uh, com um, companies that, that do the entire project except for manufacturing, a very new, a very different, uh, higher level understanding of the intimate knowledge, I would say, of the manufacturing itself, right? To understand the potential possibilities and uh, being involved with the manufacturer throughout this entire process, right? Having the, the manufacturer, even if it is external entity for them, being involved uh, all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, um, it's, uh, we've been past an hour. Um, I, I don't see any further questions. Um, I hope um, um, I was reading everything. If, if somebody still has um, a question right now, or if I missed something, please type that again real quick in the chat. I'll, uh, I'll address that. So last call for, for questions. But if not, I would say, uh, Lech, thanks so much for your industry insight. Very, very interesting. And um, like you see here on, on the last slide, uh, how you can reach Lech if you have any, um, any questions. And I would certainly... Uh, you know, advise you to, to follow what, what Oregon State is, is doing and, and, and the mass timber sector, they, um, they're pretty innovative, which is nice for me to see since we're sort of local. And um, if not, I would, uh, you know, thanks again, Lech, and thanks everybody for joining in today. And uh, Greg will um, will put that recording online. And so you should be able to review uh, the entire presentation on the YouTube channel. Okay, thanks again for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to uh, speak in this series. It's great series. Okay, okay yeah. Time. So yeah, there is no more questions. So we'll, we'll end that here, but um, you all have a good day and, and thanks very much. Thank you.